Cool. So Max, thanks for joining us. Um, uh, you know, there's a little bit of s scheduling difficulty around being in Europe and America and stuff. We may managed to make it work and I'm excited to see this talk. Um, uh, I've worked on some fuzzing stuff in the past, but I've never done so in any sort of cryptographic context and like barely even understand what that would look like. So I'm excited to see you uh, uh, school us on that. Um, so yeah, thanks again for joining and the, the floor is yours. Awesome, yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to present when I find my tag, yeah, that's it. All right. So actually before, before we start, just to cover a little bit or to know a little bit more about you, can I ask a question like who has been, who did some fuzzing in the past or anything? Um, you can also chat, I don't know. So I know I have, Jacob has, Ian has. Um, I suspect June may have done some, but I'm not sure. Anybody no, else I is haven't. free to speak up? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll then let's cover that at least to some extent. C can you see a full screen? Yeah, you should see yeah, nice a full and clear. screen, right? Yeah, all right. So yeah, today um, I want to talk about um, protocol for fuzzing using the Nodef Yao model. Um, and basically the goal is to fuzz deeper into the protocol basically um, and not only scratch the surface as the classical approaches do. So quick thing about myself, so I work at 12 bits. Um, I studied software engineering in Germany um, and this is basically my master's project, um, which we continue to work on. Um, so it's a collaboration also with um, India and France. And yeah, so basically this is just an ongoing project. Um, so not finished and we are going to publish a paper about this next month. So just some quick adver advertisement for little bits. I don't know if you know it. So we were basically an auditing company. So we audited a lot of open source stuff, a lot of um, company stuff. Um, and yeah, we also have a lot of open source tooling available, um, especially also on Rust. Um, which is also the language of choice for writing a fuzzer nowadays, in my opinion. Um, yeah, but now let's get into it. So why is this even important to fuzz or security test um, protocol? So basically along the way, so when you start out from some specification and you write an implementation um, nowadays and still you just, this, this is like a very manual process and along that way, you can introduce security vulnerabilities. So in the past, there have been like downgrade attacks, authentication bypasses. So you don't even need to own the private key. Um, or you know, service attacks are also quite common with any kind of protocol, basically, not only cryptographic protocols. Um, and yeah, classically, if the stuff is written in a memory unsafe language, you also have all the memory corruption um, stuff. So a cryptographic protocol is basically like just very informally. Um, it's a concurrent, concurrent program that relies on cryptography to secure communication. Like the most well-known example is TLS, um, but um, there's also FSH or um, other protocols. And the common goal is basically to remain confidentiality, have integrity, um, and most likely also have some sort of authentication happening. Um, and these kinds of protocols, and I would even say like anything that's concurrent is um, often very hard to implement. You most likely have to keep some state over the handshake or um, the protocol's lifetime. Um, so there have been a lot of attacks. So, and it often goes like there have been attacks and fixes attacks. So yeah, I mean, the real solution to this is actually like, formally verifying everything, um, but we are definitely out of reach for that target still um, for practical purposes. Um, so yeah, we kind of have to test these protocols um, and that's the goal of this project basically. Um, there have been like, or there are basically two major classes of vulnerabilities or bugs you can have in protocols. So there are memory corruption bugs, which is like the classical buffer overflow probably no hard bleed. Um, and the other class is logic related bugs. So that would be then an authentication bypass by sending a specifically crafted package. Um, 
And to further like categorize the classes of vulnerabilities, you sometimes have vulnerabilities that are reachable through a specific flow of messages. Um, so for example, sometimes, and it's like a re really, a really fun vulnerability, sometimes you just don't authenticate um, or don't provide a private uh, or provide a signature. And just by not providing a signature, you can bypass authentication. So what you need to do is basically um, skip a message, modify the flow, and that's how the bug manifests, basically. Um, and last but not least, there's more there's a there are vulnerabilities that you can only reach through structural modification. So that's then, for example, by modifying a field within a message. So just for example, um, if the first message of the protocol contains a list of ciphers, then you maybe can reach it by sending out a very large list or an empty list. So that's then structural. Um, so for that, you require structural modification. Um, yeah, so this is basically the space we're trying to look at. Um, and if you want to summarize this, then the two main blockers for fuzzing or security testing in general, um, even if you're writing unit tests, um, is first, you need to reach the bugs. Um, and the other is you also need to detect them. Um, and in those two spaces, like for memory corruption bugs, it's very easy to detect them, um, but it's still very hard to reach them. For example, hard bleed, is possible to find through fuzzing, um, but at the same time, it's like um, very hard and nobody found it really for uh, through fuzzing in the first place. Um, but afterwards it was like, it's possible to read through classical fuzzing. Um, and for logic bugs, the main blocker is basically to detect it. So if you have an authentication bypass, that's harder to, to detect than a memory corruption bug that could, for example, lead to crashes. Um, but yeah, let's first discuss a little bit like what is actually fuzzing um, because the like fuzzing is a testing technique. It's actually very old. So it has been used like for the first time almost 30 years ago. Um, and the basic idea is just instead of like constructing concrete test cases with unit testing, um, you're generating a random input and feeding that to the target program. So the first time fuzzing was really used was really like just piping def random to um, a CLI tool, a Unix CLI tool. Um, and yeah, you can still find bugs with that technique today, which is kind of funny. Um, and yeah, it's like nowadays it's a little bit more sophisticated of fuzzing. Um, so I want to walk you quickly how fuzzing works nowadays. Um, so it all starts with a seed corpus. So we prepare some initial test cases, um, which for example, if you're fuzzing uh, image library would be for example, an example image, a PNG file. Um, then the fuzzer picks one of those PNG files um, and mutates the PNG file to like flipping some bits, copying some bytes to another place. Um, and then that test case is executed. Or an image library, that would mean parsing um, the image. Um, and you get some output. And along the way, you're also um, gathering some feedback. Um, and if the feedback is kind of interesting, so if you, for example, if the feedback says, OK, we uncovered a new function in the um, system on the test in the, in the library, um, if that is interesting, then we add it to the seed corpus. Um, and then we just loop. So we just repeat that. So it's kind of a like it's genetically inspired a little bit, a little bit. So sometimes you say like the test cases are offspring, um, and you're mutating something, and then a test case dies or uh, survives. So that's how it's inspired. Also, um, now I just said the example of a image library. If you're fuzzing a protocol, it's slightly different. So I wanted to walk you here through. A very concrete example that's from the OpenSSL code base. Um, and this is like a classic bit level fuzzing applied to a cryptographic protocol, which is in um, like, which is not ideal, but I just wanted to show you basically how that would look like. So when you write a unit or a fuzz test, you implement a fuzzing harness. Um, and the fuzzing, the fuzzing harness classically looks like you get some input, like some, some buffer. Um, and then you send that to your program. 
Um, if you're fuzzing, for example, um, OpenSSL, you first need to create a server, an OpenSSL server, um, and then you write the bytes to it. Um, you let the library do a handshake, so process the data, and then you read that data back. So this is basically um, how a very naive um, bit-level fuzzer would work with um, OpenSSL. Um, but like you can, like um, probably you can guess, um, it's maybe very difficult for the fuzzer to um, encrypt data to really go deep into the protocol. And what this fuzzer is basically doing is just fuzzing the first unencrypted package of the protocol of the TLS protocol, but it's not going any deeper. Um, if you want to like learn more about fuzzing itself, I've been working a few months this year and the past year uh, on a handbook. Um, so we're at Trader Quiz, we're writing a testing handbook, which covers all sorts of testing. Um, and I've been working on just capturing the classic space of fuzzing, okay, walking through the tools um, and showing when to use what. Um, so feel free to check that out, uh, check that out at appsec.guide. Um, so quick recap. So we just covered basically that protocols are hard to implement and that there are different classes of vulnerability. Sometimes you have more logical bugs. Sometimes it's classical memory corruption at bugs. Uh, but reachability and detectability is specifically difficult for these protocols. Um, yeah, so yeah, just covered that reachability is difficult. Um, classical fuzzing only reaches like the surface. We only maybe find some memory corruption bugs, um, but we don't really go, go deep. Um, and detectability is difficult because an authentication bypass doesn't crash the program. Um, so we want to focus now a little bit more on these uh, log logic related bugs. <laughs> So um, there is in formal methods, there's the Stolefiar model, which is basically um, a model that tries to formalize a protocol like TLS. Um, and the main idea of the Stolefiar model is to model messages as terms. So for example, on the right here, you can see a term, which could, for example, model um, a message. So you have some decryption, so you have an enc uh, some encryption and decryption, so you basically building a message out of um, function symbols. Um, and um, you can express like functionality of, for example, encryption and decryption uh, through an equivalence relation. For example, here you say that when you decrypt an encrypted message with a K key, uh, you get a message back. Um, so that's the main idea how to, um, how to model protocol using the Dolefiar model. Um, and the main idea is, uh, or the main goal is to analyze the protocol security. And then you're kind of proving, for example, that there are no authentication vulnerabilities um, in the protocol, that you keep the um, confidentiality of the protocol. Um, and yeah, so in the Dolefiar model, the attacker, the advers adversary is, controls the whole network and can inject messages, uh, intercept messages, compute new messages. So the attacker can actually like propose new terms um, and the attacker can use cryptography. So the attacker can decrypt encrypt messages, um, but of course has, doesn't have access to private keys, for example. Um, and an important thing also is um, that with these, uh, with this Dolefiar model, we assume that cryptographic primitives um, cannot be broken. So AES works. So there are no um, implementation bugs, for example, in AES. If you want to cover like a broken um, um, primitive, then you can also model that. Um, but it's really like on, on, on a message, on a term level where you want to prove stuff. Um, and you're maybe familiar, familiar with the tooling there. Um, so there's Proverif, there's Tamarine. Um, and they try to find bugs with those tools. You can find bugs on a design level, on a specification level, um, but implementations are out of scope. Um, and this is basically where the idea comes in to um, apply fuzzing and to use the Dolef Yao model um, for fuzzing. Um, so the idea is basically instead of 
having bit input, we are um, using whole terms and messages um, and using that as an input for the fuzzer. Um, so for that, we're actually, we don't need a whole specification of a protocol in the DY model, um, but we're just formalizing traces. So that's where it's, it gets actually way simpler in my opinion. So um, basically that you only need to know that the idea of the whole fuzzing is to generate and modify traces, so specific instantiations of, uh, of the protocol. Um, and we're executing that trace in a concrete implementation like OpenSSL. Um, and that way we can like exercise and try to test the library. Um, so trace looks basically like this. So we, we have output messages or output steps with input steps. Um, and a concrete example um, of a trace is given here. So in this case, for example, we first ask the client C to output something and we bind that output to the variable W1 here. Um, and in the next step, we are inputting something to the server S, uh, which is the variable W1. Um, so in this case, we're basically just forwarding whatever the client outputted to the server. Um, in the next step, we're asking um, the server to output something. We bind that to the variable w2. Um, we then, so in, in, in the next step, we're sending some term, some message to the client C. Um, but this time, it's not just forwarding, but we're actually decrypting um, whatever the server outputted in a previous step, um, encrypting it again, and sending that to the client C. Um, so that's basically a concrete protocol flow, you could say. Um, and the fuzzer then uses such a trace to execute that um, in the implementation, uh, for example, in OpenSSL. So how is in and out actually implemented? Um, or how could you like concretize um, these very, um, uh, these steps? Um, so an output, basically like very concretely means we are reading a bit string from OpenSSL and we're binding them that to a vari variable W. Um, and we're also letting the OpenSSL library progress. So that means we're letting it do its job, progress in the handshake. Um, and in step basically means we are evaluating the term that was given to it. Um, so we're evaluating capital R um, and um, turning that message or the trace into um, a bit message. So we're, um, and then we're providing that to the um, library, to the implementation, for example, OpenSSL, and then also let the library progress, continue the handshake. Um, so we have multiple steps. So those steps basically give us um, control over the flow. So we can skip specific messages, for example, um, but we can also really fast structurally uh, by modifying the term. Um, so that kind of solves the reachability part, but there's also the detectability, the detectability thing. Um, and very shortly and roughly how the fuzzer works is um, it can detect certain kinds of vulnerabilities by looking at a list of claims made during the handshake. Um, so just very shortly, so this is basically an example uh, of which claims could have been collected during the protocol execution. Um, for example, you could collect, okay, S sent a server hello, C received a server hello with some specific parameters. Um, um, another claim that could have been made during the handshake could be the client finished um, and authenticated a server S. Um, and that's basically just some examples of claims. Um, and we're using such a list of claims to detect certain kinds of vulnerabilities, for example, authentication bypasses. That's actually the only class of vulnerabilities uh, that we're detecting right now. Um, and yeah, an example could be for authentication bypasses. Um, if the server S authenticated um, against a, a client C using a public key, but there's like in the whole 
fuzzing instance, there's no private key, like it's non-existent and it's still authenticated, then it's certainly an authentication bypass. So that's the rough idea how we're um, detecting bugs that are not only crashes. Um, let's recap quickly. So with those traces, um, we're basically solving the reachability challenge um, of fuzzing um, or of protocol, protocol fuzzing um, because the fuzzer is really able now to generate a series of structured messages. It's able to concretize such a um, long trace um, and it's able to use cryptographic um, functions. Uh, the fuzzer is now able to decrypt messages. It's able to, uh, to calculate hashes, to uh, swap terms around. Um, and yeah, detectability is kind of improved at least through this, uh, through a new bug oracle that works on these claims. Um, all of this has been implemented in a tool called TLS Puffin. Um, that's an open source uh, fuzzer written in Rust. Um, it's built on libAFL, which is basically the next generation AFL++. Um, it's quite modular, so we already support or have a proof of concept for SSH, and uh, it's like it works with several um, TLS libraries like both SSL, OpenSSL, Boring SSL. Um, and yeah, you, you maybe were wondering how can a fuzzer really compute a hash or decrypt something. Um, we need to provide implementations, and for that, we implemented 119 uh, 90 functions roughly um, that implement. Um, TLS-specific functions like hashing, decryption, and so on. Um, so this is the whole architecture of the fuzzer. fuzzer. Um, and basically, uh, like in the very, like, a, like with the bit fuzzer example, we start with the corpus. Um, and the fuzzer is picking test cases from the corpus according to some schedule, like maybe it prefers short test cases, maybe it prefers um, test cases that take a long time to execute. Um, the test case then goes to the mutational stage where it gets mutated. We then execute the test case, the trace um, in the um, SUT or like the library OpenSSL. Um, and depending on whether this test case is interesting or actually caused a security violation, like caused an authentication bypass, we either add it to the corpus back or we add it to the, um, to the bugs, to the real results um, of, uh, of the fuzzing. Um, and I quickly want to like look now a little bit into the mutations that can happen, which are like very protocol specific. Um, so there are several mutations that can be applied to, uh, to, the, to a trace. So you can skip steps, you can repeat specific steps, um, so those are like more on the trace trace level and allow you to modify the flow um, of the um, protocol. Um, and if you want to mutate within specific terms, so want to like change change a field, for example, within um, a uh, step, um, there are mutations that can swap two terms between two two steps. Um, there's a mutation that can generate and replace. Um, a specific subterm, um, and then there are there are several replace mutations that either like change, for example, um, a specific hashing algorithm to just changes the function symbol, um, or mutations that take one subterm and place it somewhere else, um, and one uh, mutations that can lift terms. So that's then. Um, specifically helpful if you have a term that represents a list of ciphers, for example, um, then this replace um, mutation will basically remove an entry of a list from a list. Um, another more, um, the main specific part is the Spark Oracle, which allows us to resolve um, detectability. Um, and with the new Buck Oracle and TLS Puffin, um, you can still detect like the classic, classical crashes, um, the crashes through from address sanitizer if you have some buffer overflow. Um, but you also have these domain-specific DY um, um, detection 
mechanisms um, that allow you to um, detect agreement bugs or um, authentic authentication bypasses. Um, so this part of the puzzle really solves this detectability challenge. Um, so during, during my master thesis, but also um, later on, uh, we were able to find, re rediscover several vulnerabilities. Um, so basically this was our starting point. The first challenge really was, can we find those vulnerabilities through fuzzing? Um, so they have been discovered. So those vulnerabilities may have been discovered through code review, um, but not yet through fuzzing. And we wanted to show that our fuzzer can rediscover those, but classical bit level fuzzers cannot find them. Um, so that's how we first rediscovered three vulnerabilities. Um, and on top of that, we, did, we discovered, I think, six or seven um, new vulnerabilities. Um, for example, yeah, those have been mostly related to den denial of service uh, attacks. Um, yeah, we also have some future work. Um, we kind of noticed that the coverage feedback, so the metric which kind of decides whether a test case is interesting or not. Um, it's kind of poor and it doesn't really work well for protocols. So it's kind of like the code coverage doesn't really tell much about whether um, a protocol execution has been interesting. For example, if you imagine causing an authentication bypass, the code coverage uh, covered during such a handshake pretty similar to just a regular handshake. So ideally we would improve on that feedback um, and not only look at code coverage, but maybe also something like protocol coverage, enabled features. Um, so this is kind of an open research question. How can you get good feedback out of um, uh, fast testing protocol? Um, yeah, and also another reason why code coverage is specifically poor. Um, Bit-level fuzzers, for example, enable a lot of TLS features because you can enable or trigger TLS features through the first unencrypted message. So you can exercise every cipher, but um, then later on, the bit-level fuzzer cannot use them, the ciphers. Um, but that way you reach a lot of code coverage, but actually you're discovering it discovering like zero of the protocol. Um, so there's definitely a mismatch between uh, code coverage and actually exercising the protocol. Um, more future work is definitely also needed in improving the bug oracle. So we have authentication bypasses, um, but definitely we also want to cover more, um, more bug classes. Um, yeah, and maybe we could do something like differential fuzzing where we're comparing one implementation like OpenSSL to WolfSSL and that way can find protocol bugs like differences in implementations. Um, and yeah, never ending target is definitely also just extending to more protocols, more implementation. So we recent, recently added boring SSL, um, but of course like there's always work to do in that area. Um, and very long-term, like the long-term goal is really to aut automate this. So right now supporting a new protocol is a lot of work. Um, and yeah, maybe we could automate something with large language models, but um, yeah, that, that's kind of a new idea. Those things didn't exist uh, a few years ago. Um, yeah, the, the main new contributions in, in this work was to design um, a fuzzing approach that is like specifically targeted towards cryptographic protocols because they were kind of out of scope. They are kind of out of scope for bit level fuzzers. Um, and we were able to like capture this class of logical attacks, uh, of attacks specifically targeted towards the DY uh, model uh, for the first time. Um, and we implemented and evaluated uh, TLS Puffin uh, library. Um, and contribution is definitely also the paper we will be publishing uh, next month at uh, SMP. All right, so that's it. I'm happy about any discussions um, or questions from your side. Max, that was awesome. Thank you so much.
Uh, maybe I'll just kick us off with one and then other people should feel free to jump in. Um, so a bunch of the problems you find are denials of service. I don't, I study transport protocols. I don't study cryptographic protocols, but my intuition would be that like cryptographic protocols might be particularly subject to DOS attacks because they have such rigid requirements for like the thing needs to be signed properly. And, you know, the, the authentication needs to, it's not like a best effort, right? You need to actually know the password. So is that the case? Is it generally like easier to achieve a DOS attack than other types of attacks against the uh, cryptographic protocols? Um, I would say it's mostly like, this, I can only speak for the bugs we found, but they were like very classical, I would say, like just okay. combining two arrays in the wrong way. And then you have a buffer overflow and it crashes or a double free. Um, I see. They weren't like so, logic bugs yeah. in the, the design of the thing. They were purely implementation bugs. Oh yeah, like the goal is definitely only to find implementation bugs. Right. Um, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Ian, go for it. So I, I, I think I'm. I think I'm not fully understanding how the pieces fit together. My let me let me kind of say how I think it works and you can tell me where I get it wrong. So the the idea seems to be I I generate a trace uh, based on a term algebra. That term algebra is specific to the protocol or is it just considering term algebras for the cryptographic primitives? Does that question make sense? Um I mean both. Yeah, I think it makes sense. I mean, you could definitely reuse certain um, like function symbols and implementations of that across protocols. Um, but of course, most like like term, like I would say the term algebra should be specific to the protocol. Um, right. okay, for example, yeah. because the term <laughs> algebra also implements the key schedule and that's specific to TLS. Right. Okay. And so when you, when you take a, a, a trace and you implement it using an actual system under test like OpenSSL. Maybe you can go back to the slide where that's described the there's a there's a harness portion and then there's um I'm not sure which one you mean the the yeah that the 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 next one. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah so so you need this harnessing library that is going to read a bit string yes. as the result of a previously produced bit string from uh, an uh, an out an out message within the trace. Um, mm -hmm. We are basically taking this output of OpenSSL and then applying some structural parsing to it. So you could say mm -hmm. like that's also required. Um, most of the time, there's at least a parser available for a protocol. Um, so in this case, we borrowed a lot of code from Rust TLS, um, which is a Rust-based TLS implementation. Um, and they like we use code there to de to deframe or get frames of TLS messages, get records, um, and just basically um, parse down to the uh, field level. Um, and then we record, record that basically state of the fuzzer. So it's stateful fuzzing that way. Um, and then the function um, implement the functions later doing the in step, the attack terms, the terms can use that knowledge um, to uh, to like create the bit in the, the input that's sent back to the TLS implementation. Does that make sense? Yeah, and so like in a in a Dolevya like verifier, you'll have cert you'll have um, term elements that have particular sorts. So like you'll have nonces which are assumed to be fresh and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, when you're relating terms to um, bit strings, for example, um, I guess some part of the the fuzzer has to take into account those expected semantics from the like symbolic model. Is that is that right? Like it has to, you know, say, okay, if I if I have a nonce here, 
you know, symbolically, that's just the only assumption is that it's fresh, right? But when I then send it to a bit vector, okay, it has to have a particular length. And it also is usually generated using some secure randomness. So or like, I guess the idea is like, okay, I see nonce in symbolic world and I use a cryptographic PRNG in OpenSSL or something like that. Is that how that works? Um, yeah, yeah. Like you, you need to concretize everything. So um, a nonce would likely be like not really fresh in this case, but it's fake to be fresh that way. Um, but yeah, you need concrete implementations of everything. Like if you're using a constant um, or anything, you need to like define something in concrete code. That's like, um, it has that many bytes and everything. So you also have kind of types because um, the functions need to know like what's the input, what's the output. Um, and we're using the, the Rust type system there yeah, in the implementation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but definitely, you, you need to define define everything and yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay that makes sense um the only other thing that i think i i i kind of missed as you were going through things is how i definitely see how it's enough when to to do the protocol tracing and uh, i mean this is obviously going to get much better reachability i think it's a great idea and I could see how, like, as you're basically composing all of these open SSL functions, you could hit um, uh, bugs that are easy to detect by virtue of, like, you know, having a buffer overflow or something like that. Um, but you also have this component that attempts to identify um, uh, protocol level uh, verify or or detect. Um, violations of protocol level properties like authentication yeah and, you know forward secrecy whatever whatever they might be um how does that work like what's what's happening at the level of open ssl which is performing that checking does that make sense yeah um so i, I actually just edited that slide very late because i noticed like i, I didn't really touch too much on that that part um to, to be fair, that was like definitely one of the last topics that were added to it. Um, and there's definitely a lot of room for improvement. Um, but like how roughly works is that we have these claims that we extract during execution. Um, and best case, we can use APIs that are like then specific to OpenSSL or Boring SSL or whatever library to extract some information. Um, we kind of hook into the library um, and hope, like best case, there's an API for hooking into the library to extract information at certain times. Um, for authentication, that, that works perfectly. So we can extract like which public key has been used for authentication. Um, we can use claims like which um, agent in our uh, scenario received which, which library. So we can like collect these um, claims over time then we can basically use something like first order logic to really determine like based on those claims uh, has there been an authentication um, violation. So um, that doesn't allow us, for example, to capture something like confidentiality because that, that's very hard. Like how, how do you mm -hmm. say that a specific secret information has been leaked? That, that's hard. Um, but for authentication uh, where you have yeah, you can determine authentication bypasses based on specific information um, outputted by OpenSSL at specific times. I see. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the thing that I was trying to get at was whether or not that those checks were also related to properties that were expressed in the term algebra. So if you have like um, a verifier like uh, Proverif or Tamarin, you'll specify the term algebra and the whole protocol in some logic, but that, you know, Tamarin uses rewriting logic, but, um, but then you'll also have the properties specified in, in that logic uh, as properties over traces. So like one simple thing you can say is like, you know, um, unless I, <laughs> unless a, a long-term key is leaked, then, you know, 
leaking a short term key preserves forward secrecy. And you can basically like um, specify a lot of the properties that you care about as properties over the trace. And so I was thinking that maybe one way you could do this without relying on, it's probably more efficient and better in some ways to do it the way that you're describing, where you're pulling out certain state from OpenSSL mm -hmm. that you know corresponds to like successive authentication. But if you wanted to do this um, in a way that kind of corresponds more closely to the way that uh, a symbolic prover would would do this, oh, yeah, you could um, you could instead uh, basically check check properties at certain points during execution, but only at the level of messages being passed, and then check other properties later. So like the classic one, I mean, uh, the classic one is like, if you didn't see a message of this shape anywhere, and then you see a message of this shape, that's bad. Where, what? you know, I didn't see a message anywhere where the, um, the key was leaked. And then I see a message or a, a term being derived by the attacker, which is the key. Um, th these sorts of yeah. properties. Um, and and that wouldn't require as much. Uh, my guess is that that wouldn't require as much coupling to the particular system under test uh, because you're only dealing with those properties as specified at the level of traces. I don't know if that makes sense, but I thank you for oh, yeah, your uh, explanation of how the how that protocol stuff worked. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely that makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't have too much um, experience like with using uh, or verifying protocols like in, in Tembrin or Proverb. Um, so it's kind of hard to me to say which kind of properties would you be able to check that way. Um, but I think it makes sense. Like if you have a trace which uh, succeeds, and you can like read from that trace that something bad happened, um, then you can easily detect that um, by just looking at a trace and using a more um, proverbial style uh, query uh, that can um, detect that, yeah. I yeah, you, you may look at some of the very simple Tamarin examples. Um, like there's there's really simple like Naxos like examples for Tamarin where they like the 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 property uh, is related, like each element of the property as it's stated in Tamarin is related back to a property as specified in the original Naxos paper. Um, mm -hmm. And so you, you might be able to, to, I guess all I'm saying is you don't have to learn all of Tamarin in order to understand kind of how it oh, yeah, how yeah, works. Yeah. And, yeah. and the, other than fancier stuff that, that these tools do, they're all, one trace properties so like they're not doing anything that you couldn't do in theory <laughs> now in practice i don't know others have to go fast and stuff like that but yeah true yeah. yeah i i wonder if you could get model-based fuzzing for free if you had some clever way to connect implementations to tamarin or proverif models which could also yeah. be interesting because right now, unless I misunderstand, I don't think you're able to determine if an implementation incorrectly implements the spec, right? You're just able to see like, is there a bug in the way the code is written? But it's also the case that in my experience, sometimes people write protocol implementations that just, you know, fundamentally don't, don't do what the spec says to do. And you could find those with model-based fuzzing if you had some way to, which might also get back to your point about LLMs. You had this like little crumb at the end and right, if you had some nice way of making like a harness that connected a Tamarin or Proverif model to your implementation, perhaps with some some LLM cleverness that could find a whole new class of bugs. It should be kind of cool. Mm. Yeah, definitely like connecting that more with uh, the classical um, model is, Definitely on on the roadmap or but more a long term goal I would say. Um, yeah, I mean fun fundamentally you just like the idea for coming up with uh, which properties to check and it's it's basically you know, the same with um, um, formally verifying a TLS is just looking at RFC coming up with um, ideas of which things to check um, and then you're like yeah basically you want more or less to have the same queries as you would have in Proverb Tamarin. You would like to have those in uh, 
um, TLS Puffin, you just just need a way to 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 do that basically and, and link that up. Um, yeah. By the way, yeah, it's worth I, I saying. I think there's something that's obvious to like four people on this chat and nobody else, which is that. Um, so, so if you see in the comments, June wrote some comment about like, oh, it would be cool to use formal grammars for fuzzing. And um, the three of us talking as well as Jacob are all aware that grammar based fuzzing is like a really rich area with a bunch of research, but a lot of other people don't know that. So maybe just a quick plug that if you're interested in doing grammar based fuzzing, uh, both TOB or MaxWorks and Galois where uh, Ian works do a lot of grammar based fuzzing stuff. And there's a whole bunch of research in that space. And um, uh, I'm happy to point people toward research papers if they're interested. Oh, that is awesome. I, I wasn't aware there was already a big field around this. Yeah, totally. Yeah, the, the other thing is, um, well, I, I, I'm sure other people do research on it, but both uh, Leo, well, I guess I was, I was going to say both. So Leo Lampropoulos at UMD uh, has historically done work on property-based testing, but has looked into combining property-based testing with fuzzing. And, and this is also a, a, a very closely related area. And, and Max, I, I do I do like your idea of connecting um, existing verification tools to this uh, work, primarily because it's, it's uh, a huge um, uh, savings, uh, at least ideally, it's a huge savings in terms of development effort because there's already a ton of models for other protocols um, and the associated properties in these tools. So if you if you had a mechanism for saying like, you know, now okay, now I want to do five G or now I want to do um, Kerberos or whatever, uh, there are already term algebras for those things. For example, written in Tamarin uh, and Proverif and and all of these things. And and so if you mm -hmm. have a mechanism for just translating them. Then you could do that, and if the if the um, if the uh, interop uh, or the the mechanism for tying the term algebra to the harness were equally kind of generic, where you could hook into a message passing interface or something like that, um, that would be even better. And I could so the other thing that that might be worth looking into is um, Max, if you haven't already. Uh, the um, uh, automata learning stuff that then has the, so the automata learning tools already need to do this. Some of them already need to do this like mapping between the abstract world and the concrete world. And so there may also be um, existing tools and whatever to steal there for- um, Totally or performing that that uh, that refinement from the from the term algebra world or or abstract message world to uh, to uh, the bit strings and buffers uh, world. Did you say uh, autonomy learning or Auto automata learning? There's one particular tool that. Do you remember what I'm talking about, Max? I think it's Tiago's yeah, yeah. tool. Yeah, there's um, this guy, Tiago Ferria, yeah, who did some work uh, both at Galois and elsewhere um, on automata learning. But what's cool is basically like you want to study some implementation and you don't want to pay a grad student to suffer for six months writing a model. So what if you just could learn the model mm -hmm. automatically by like instrumenting okay. the traces, right? Mm -hmm. And it turns out you can do this with some clever math, which Tiago worked out. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think Ian just put the link in the chat. Um, and you could imagine, uh, potentially doing interesting things like in a model-based paradigm, I could imagine learning a model of one implementation of TLS v1.2.3.2 whatever, and then using that model to fuzz a different implementation. And now if there's any discrepancy, that's an interesting thing, right? So mm -hmm. uh, this it seems like, I don't want to say low-hanging fruit because none of this is easy. It's all very hard, <laughs> but there's a bunch of like academically low-hanging fruit in this really interesting area that you're working in, right? Which is exciting. Yeah. And the, the, definitely one, like when you were, talking about the um, like there are many models available I mean specifically with like it's it's, it's very funny um, because like three years ago there haven't been any LLMs and now you, like you could theoretically say like I haven't tried it but you you could let LLMs implement it 
um, and iterate that way and maybe brute force few um, uh, Tom algebra with concrete implementations. Um, but like the, the yeah, learning or the going from implementation to model and maybe keeping some of the implementations along that way uh, could also be interesting. Um, I, I did some of this yeah, at Galois with trying to get LLMs to write formal models. And my experience was that at least with the current stuff, a one-shot approach did not work well. But I think that there's definitely room for like a CGIS kind of thing where you come up with a model and then you find a bug in the model and then you have it fix it. And then if it's a bug and then it fixes it, and you do that over and over until you reach some stable state. I, I totally think we'll see some papers that do that kind of thing in various contexts in the next year or two. Like that just seems very intuitive and doable. Yeah, and the, the, the best, you know, the good thing about like this kind of fuzzing is you don't need a complicated and correct um, right model. You just you just need a set of functions basically, and then like some initial feed or like some initial working um, traces. Um, so it's easier to achieve definitely, maybe yeah, than than a current like deriving a correct or correct model also tr try to let uh uh gpt generate some prover of stuff but it was like not usable yeah i had the same experience i put two papers in the in the chat that might be useful in particular i think tiago's paper Um, particularly practical to follow up on is that he already has inside of his tool, he has this like adapter component that relates um, abstract messages to, to bit strings and a, a nice little API and stuff. So you might see if his tool is open source and maybe you can just like, you know, steal some of it. Um, uh, and then uh, the second paper that I linked is, um, has to do with relating a Tamarin specification to a particular implementation by doing fancy theorem proving stuff, but mm -hmm. that's another place where there um, you might find useful nuggets for this, you know, difficult work of connecting the abstract model down onto a, a, these are suggestions more for um, tools that do similar operations to the tool that your that your tool is doing. So you might be able to yeah. save some work by very interesting, yeah. definitely. I, I wasn't aware of all of this work. So nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess the last I, I have I have one other thought, um, which is if you wanna go toe to toe with the um protocol verifiers, uh, then one, one in, I think one of the most important pieces of future research is going to be the, um, the guidance metric for protocol coverage. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think that one of the, one of the main limitations of the protocol verification tools is that, um, the, the kinds of models that you can write are limited by like the, what the tool can actually verify. So there's, there are lots of things that aren't modeled because modeling it would be, would, would blow. Blow up the various, when you're just picking random things from that space. And if you do that intelligently enough, you don't, you don't have to cover the whole thing. You just have to find the ones that matter. And so I think that this idea of um, either augmenting or moving away from AFL in order to get coverage, me not coverage metrics, but like, you know, metrics that help you explore traces that are interesting for um, protocol properties like authentication and stuff like that uh, would be really yeah. valuable. My, my guess is that you'd be able to, um, you know, find some stuff that embarrasses all of the Pro Verif and, and Tamarin folks and and uh, uh, get some get some, yeah. get some some splash out of that. <laughs> Definitely, like yeah, I think as far as I know, we don't really have a good idea yet 
uh, on how such a coverage could look like, but it's 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 the major pain point because I assume actually using code coverage versus random fuzzing, I, we didn't benchmark it, but I don't assume such a huge difference. Um, yeah, um, it's definitely um, not not ideal. Um, and code coverage is also like terrible. It has a lot of issues in evaluating and benchmarking one fuzzer against another one. So it's, um, yeah, I think that's the highest priority to some extent here to really um, find something better. Um, but yeah, diff difficult, definitely. Cool. Yeah, well, one thing like... we've been trying to do recently is, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Max. Uh, uh, yeah, well, one thing we're recently doing, um, which is a little bit related to coverage, is we we've been like trying to like use the DY model to go deep into the protocol, but then do bit level fuzzing. Um, I think for that the code coverage is very beneficial. So ideally, in the future, it would be a mix probably, but um, yeah, that's definitely not not enough. For the whole thing. Well, I'll, I'll I'll give somebody else a shush. I had one other idea. Yeah, I was after you say, said that, but I'll I'll stop talking. We we probably have time for like one more question. So if anybody else has a question, this is your time to shine. Um. So Max, I have one question, which is that at TOB, it seems like there's a lot of work done on software testing, fuzzing, all these different types of things. How often would you say you use other techniques? Like how often are you just going into a binary manually statically reversing things? Why is this an interest of yours? And how much time do you spend doing other techniques too? Do you mean specifically for TLS? So this is basically just a research project. Um... Yeah, I just mean more generally, your own interests in this. Take it in any direction you like if it's too big. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, more specific, I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay, I mean, so I guess, say, like, how similar is this TLS fuzzing object to other ones have the departure from what you typically do? Is this kind of the natural continuation of your phone work? Um, I mean, basically, this was my entry to a security as a whole. So basically, this, 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 this is the reason why I'm working definitely at 12 bits or why we came like like together. Um, and yeah, I mean, I was definitely very interested from the start in the, in the lib AFL part. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm from time to time, most, most of the time I'm contributing bugs to lib AFL or the AFL++ people. Um, but yeah, lib AFL is definitely a, a big thing, I would say for me. Um, contributing and working on and trying to use it more 12 bits for different projects. Um, Cause yeah, I believe that's really the way forward compared to AFL plus um, plus, but it still needs a lot of work to be done. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Cool, Max, thank you so much. This is terrific. Um, is it okay with you if I put the recording up online for people who couldn't make the talk and want to watch yeah. it afterward? Okay, awesome. I'll do that. And uh, hopefully I'll see you at, at Oakland, you know, modulo questions of whether or yeah. not I have funding <laughs> to go. But uh, uh, regardless, good luck at the talk and we really appreciate your time. Thank you all. Yeah, okay. bye. Thank you, Max. Bye.